subscribe to our channel and hit the bell icon so that you know when live we go. Hello and welcome to Rao's IAS DNA session. We are going to have a discussion on today's newspaper, The Hindu, the edition dated 23rd April 2022. We shall take up articles important for the civil service examination and discuss them as per the demand of the exam. Today's DNS will be jointly taken by myself, Navid sir and Mangal sir. There is an article on page number 6. ISRO to launch reusable launch vehicle landing experiment. This experiment is to be carried out by end of this month. The landing experiment is a critical component of reusable launch vehicle technology demonstration program of ISRO. The idea of reusable launch vehicle is to develop the capability to deliver a payload into outer orbit and then re-enter into the earth atmosphere and land vertically just the way it took off. There must be capability to land this launch vehicle in a suitable place where refueling can be done. Of course, there would be requirement of some refurbishment as well. But in a short turnaround time, this launch vehicle can be used yet again. So it will function like aeroplanes, like they take off, land on another airport and from there they take off again. But the process will not be exactly the same because some part of the rocket will be destroyed during a mission. But the bulk of it will re-enter the Earth's atmosphere and land very much like an aeroplane. Presently, we do not have a fully functional reusable launch vehicle in the world. NASA doesn't have it, but SpaceX has been doing it for a long time to a considerable extent. But it is not fully reusable launch vehicle. The program of ISRO plans, plans to recover the first and the second stage of the rocket. NASA plans this reusable launch vehicle for GSLV Mark III. And you know the rocket engine of GSLV Mark III has three stages. And the third stage is cryogenic. But recovery will be done only of the first and the second stage. And the third stage has to be dispensed off. So there has to be some rearrangement that would be done in the engine stages of GSLV Mark III. The second stage will be made cryogenic. Successful completion of these experiments and full-fledged development of reusable launch vehicle will revolutionize the space sector. Reusable launch vehicle reduces the cost of the space agencies in terms of cutting down the cost of the recovered portion of the rocket. And it can cut down the cost drastically from around $200 million to $60 million. This cost reduction in the reusable launch vehicle has already been achieved. And according to Elon Musk, if one can figure out how to effectively use reusable launch vehicle like aeroplanes, the cost of access to space will be reduced by as much as a factor of 100. So far, we haven't achieved this technology. This is the fundamental breakthrough which is needed to revolutionize the access to space. Because once we learn to do the same thing again and again in a short turnaround time with lower cost, then we can go to the asteroids for mining. We can go to the moon for mining. We can go to Mars for mining. Space exploration in a real sense will begin only when we achieve this technology of reusable launch vehicle. Since much of the stages of the rockets they are recovered, the technology hence will also help in reducing space debris. With the reduced cost of the launch vehicle, it will be cheaper to launch more satellites. And you know that more satellites are used, the demand of satellites, communication satellites and earth observation satellites in the coming time is going to exorbitantly increase because of the concept of Internet of Things. Everything is going to come online and data processing requirement and the earth observation and communication is going to be humongous. And in future, public trips to Mars will be made reality only if we have this technology. And then we can seriously think about ideas that seem to be sci-fi presently, like colonization of Mars. There's a news article on page number 8, Fishing for Workable Solutions in the Park Bay. See, both Indian and Sri Lankan fishermen have been fishing in the Park Bay for centuries. Park Bay is a semi-enclosed shallow water body between southeast coast of India and Sri Lanka. The fishing issue between the two countries emerged only after a maritime agreement was signed by India and Sri Lanka in 1974. The initial pact of 1974 deciding on the international maritime boundary between India and Sri Lanka did not affect fishing on either side and, and fishermen used to easily go and come across this maritime boundary line. 
but it was in 1976 through exchange of letters that both India and Sri Lanka agreed to stop fishing in each other's water. And hence this treaty of 1974 with some understanding in 1976 to demarcate this international maritime boundary line created problem for fishermen mostly from India. There were other provisions of this treaty as well. For example, India and Sri Lanka effectively created a two-nation pond in this region. This agreement was done of course under the provision of United Nations Convention on the Laws of the Sea. The two-nation pond here means that the third nation will not be allowed either for shipping or for fishing. But despite signing of this maritime boundary, the problem is still persist because fishermen knows no boundary. And it is often because of their inexperience that they are not even aware that they have trespassed the international maritime boundary line. But Sri Lankan authorities were not very stringent about it until 1983 when the Elam war broke out. And from 2009, after the end of the war, the Sri Lankan navy has been very very strict about it. There are hundreds of Indian fishermen, mostly from the state of Tamil Nadu, languishing in the jail of Sri Lanka just because they have crossed this line. So in 2016, India and Sri Lanka agreed to set up a joint working group as a mechanism to help find a permanent solution to the fishermen issue. One of the main reasons as to why this issue still persists is that the Kachat Tevu, this is a small islet. This has gone on the other side of international maritime boundary line. So this is on the Sri Lankan side. But fishermen have used it since ages for sorting of their catch or drying of the nets. And they are in the habit of coming to this island. This island also serves the purpose of growth of fisheries around it. So fishermen often risk their life to cross the international maritime boundary line rather than return empty-handed. But Sri Lankan Navy has been on alert lately and they either arrest the fishermen or destroy their fishing nets and vessels. And this is creating aminosity in the Tamil Nadu region for Sri Lankan authorities. There's another issue of trawling. Indian fishermen use trawlers and trawlers are banned in Sri Lanka. They take the trawlers and cross the international maritime boundary line and hence they are in legal trouble. Government of India has taken some measures in this regard. First and foremost, the problem of not being aware whether one has crossed the international maritime boundary line or not for that purpose. The government of India has geotagged the international maritime boundary line. Although it's an invisible line, but, but because of geotagging and using GPS to find that geotagging, one can easily know the location of the international maritime boundary line. There have been also many apps developed to help the fishermen to alert them if they are coming close to the international maritime boundary line. Government of India has started deep sea fishing scheme. This was started in 2016-17. Deep sea fishing scheme has been started as an alternative to bottom trawling so that the Tamil Nadu fisherman gives up trawling. The water in the Park Bay is not very deep so it's easy to get to the floor of the sea using the trawlers. But if deep sea fishing will be allowed then the range for the fishermen to fish will increase and the scheme envisages the provision of 200 deep sea fishing boats. By 2020 which is the third and the final year of implementation of this scheme now since the problem persists, the scheme can be enlarged and implemented even further. This was taken up as part of blue revolution of government of India. What more can be done by government of India is first of all ban the trawlers. Ban all equipments which are banned in Sri Lanka. Also ban the fishing practices that do irreparable damage to the ecology. But then it has to be managed and regulated because it's the only region between India and Sri Lanka, that Park Bay region, that has shallow water. So the equipment that Sri Lankan government is banning, it cannot be banned across the Indian coast because water across the Odisha coast is very deep. So such equipment will be required in those coasts. So the government can't do blanket banning but it has to be regulated in this particular region. Government of India is already running Pradhan Mantri Matse Sampada Yojana and this scheme can be used proactively in the state of Tamil Nadu because it also covers alternative livelihood measures. And the scheme also encourages inland shipping or coastal shipping using seaweed cultivation or open sea cage cultivation or sea ranching. So that will reduce the pressure in the Park Bay around the international maritime boundary line. There are suggestions from certain quarters that India and Sri Lanka can also think of joint development of fisheries harbour. The joint working group of the India and Sri Lanka already has agreed for doing joint research on fisheries. If they develop joint harbours around the islets in the Park Bay and give the fishing rights to both sides, then the problem will be solved to a considerable extent. 
There are also suggestions to transform Park Bay into a common heritage altogether, where the different stakeholders, the two union government, the provincial government of Sri Lanka, the state government of India, Indian Coast Guards, ecological experts and the fishermen community, they together will hold this common heritage. See, above all, this should not be a persistent contentious issue between the two nations. There are many other things to sort out. There are infrastructure collaboration between India and Sri Lanka. There are economic financial collaboration. Sri Lanka also be a little lenient and empathetic towards the arrested fishermen. Towing on a very strict legal line will not help in this regard. And especially when this is not an insurmountable problem. There are many options available to make the Park Bay not only free of troubles, but also a model for collaborative endeavors in fishing. Now let's take up this news appearing on page number 12. Now this news says, Niti Ayo gets new vice chairman. The government has appointed Suman Keberi as the vice chairman of Niti Ayo following the resignation of Rajiv Kumar. Now this news says that appointments committee of the cabinet has accepted the resignation of Rajiv Kumar. So in this news analysis, you need to know the important role which has been played by Niti Ayog since its constitution in 2015. And here you also need to know about the various cabinet committees and who chairs these cabinet committees. And in this regard, you also need to know about the governing council of Niti Ayog, which is chaired by the Prime Minister of India. Further, Niti Ayog has also played a very important role in fostering competitive and cooperative federalism in India. So an extract from the website of Niti Ayog says that Niti Ayog is developing itself as the state-of-the-art resource center with necessary knowledge and skills which will enable it to act with speed, promote research and innovation, provide strategic policy vision for the government and deal with contingent issues. And here Niti Ayog is supported by an attached office, development monitoring and evaluation organization, a flagship initiative Atal Innovation Mission and an autonomous body, namely the National Institute of Labor, Economics, Research and Development. And overall, the entire activities done by Niti Ayo can be divided into four main heads. These are policy and program framework, cooperative federalism, work done with respect to monitoring and evaluation purposes, and also acting as think tank and knowledge and innovation hub. Further, with respect to the governing council, it comprises of Chief Minister of all states and union territories having legislative assembly and also the Lieutenant Governor of other union territories. And regarding the functioning of governing council, it says that it is the premier body tasked with evolving a shared with the vision of national priorities and strategies with the active involvement of all states. So through this governing council, Niti Ayog effectively ensures cooperative federalism by involving all states in terms of policy decision making. So it says that the governing council which embodies the objective of cooperative federalism presents a platform to discuss intersectoral, interdepartmental and federal issues to accelerate the implementation of national developmental agenda. So based on our discussion so far, the first practice question for your prelims is that the governing council of Niti Ayog is chaired by various options are available such as vice chairman of Niti Ayog, chief executive officer of Niti Ayog, cabinet secretary or the prime minister. I hope you know the answer now. This question says that appointments committee of the cabinet is chaired by options are prime minister, home minister, defense minister and finance minister. So in this regard, you need to know the various cabinet committees and who chairs these cabinet committees. So as you can see, the appointments committee is chaired by the prime minister. Cabinet committee on economic affairs is also chaired by the prime minister. Cabinet committee on political affairs is also chaired by the prime minister. The cabinet committee on security. Cabinet Committee on Investment and Growth and Cabinet Committee on Employment and Skill Development are all chaired by the Prime Minister. Whereas Cabinet Committee on Parliamentary Affairs is chaired by the Union Defence Minister and Cabinet Committee on Accommodation is chaired by the Union Home Minister. Now coming back to Niti Ayog, this was formed by the Resolution of Union Cabinet under the Government of India Allocation of Business Rules 1961, which are framed with respect to Article 77 Clause 3 of the Indian Constitution. So it says that Niti Ayog has been mandated to foster cooperative and competitive federalism, evolve a national consensus on developmental goals, redefine the reforms agenda, achieve SDG goals, that is sustainable developmental goals, act as a platform for resolution of cross-sectoral issues between central and state governments, and also ensures capacity building of states and also act as a knowledge and innovation hub. So these can be summarized as the work done by Niti Ayog. 
So as we have seen that the work of Niti Aayog or the functions of Niti Aayog can be categorized into these four heads, namely to foster cooperative federalism, monitoring and evaluation purposes, to act as a resource center and knowledge hub, and design policy and program framework. So these can be broadly said to be the functions of Niti Aayog. Now let's go through some of the steps taken by Niti Aayog to ensure cooperative federalism. The first aspect highlighted is the governing council chaired by the prime minister and it also involves the chief minister of states and union territories and also the lieutenant governors. Now this council ensures or helps to resolve differences among states and also chart a common course of action for progress and prosperity of various states. Further the Aayog has also constituted a subgroup of chief ministers for MG Narega and agriculture for discussion on centrally sponsored schemes for skill development and also Swachh Bharat. Now regarding MG Narega and Agriculture, five critical areas have been identified to improve. Reducing the cost of cultivation, enhancing production through efficient use of water and other inputs, providing remunerative prices to farmers by incentivizing aggregation and market infrastructure, rehabilitating agricultural land and assets after natural disasters, and also replanting using MG Narega fund and bringing diversification in agriculture. The other steps taken by Niti Aayog with respect to cooperative federalism are constituting a task force on agricultural development. And this task force helps to coordinate and develop synergy with central ministries and state government task forces, recommend strategies for reinvigorating agriculture. The task force formulates strategies for reforms, innovation and technology diffusion and also helps to identify successful experiments and programs for states and union territories. Further, the Niti Aayog has also constituted Niti Forum for Northeast to address various challenges in the region and recommend requisite interventions to achieve sustainable economic growth. It has also constituted sustainable development in the Indian Himalaya region. It has also provided for development support services for states and union territories to achieve transformational and sustained delivery of infrastructure project. And the development support services has the following objectives to establish center-state partnership model for cooperation, reimagine and transform delivery of infrastructure projects, establish public-private partnership as governance tools supporting larger developmental agenda, to address key structural issues that states face in conceiving, structuring and implementing infrastructure projects, build institutional and organizational capacities of states and state-level institutions to conceive, conceptualize, structure and implement infrastructure projects. Further, Niti Aayog has also come up with Project Saath E or Sustainable Action for Transforming Human Capital Education, which aims to identify and build three role model states for school education sector. And apart from this, recently Niti Aayog has come up with E Amrit, and E Amrit deals with electric vehicles as this portal busts myths around the adoption of EVs, highlights about investment opportunities, provides for various policies, subsidies, etc. And this portal, e Amrit, has been developed and hosted by Niti Aayog under a collaborative knowledge exchange program with the UK government and as a part of UK-India Joint Roadmap 2030, signed very recently by the Prime Ministers of two countries. So please remember e Amrit as this is a very recent initiative of Niti Aayog, which has been initiated under a collaborative knowledge exchange program with the government of United Kingdom. An e Amrit of Niti Aayog intends to raise awareness on electric vehicles and sensitize consumers on the benefits of switching to electric vehicles. So, based on this understanding, this becomes your third practice question, which says Niti Forum for Northeast, e Amrit, and Project Saath are an initiative of options are A. Prime Minister's Office, B. Ministry of External Affairs, C. Niti Aayog, and D. Finance Commission. So these are some of the important steps which have been taken by Niti Aayog in the field of cooperative federalism. Now talking about competitive federalism. Here Niti Aayog intends to promote competitive federalism by facilitating improved performance of states and union territories through various indices. It encourages healthy competition among states through transparent rankings in various sectors along with hand-holding approach of states for aspirational districts. And some of the indices launched by Niti Aayog are School Education Quality Index, State Health Index, Composite Water Management Index, Sustainable Development Goals Index, India Innovation Index, and Export Competitiveness Index. And in this, you can also add Delta Rankings for Aspirational District Program. And these Delta Rankings are released every month for different districts. Now, these different indices 
not only highlights about the performance of states but also inculcates a sense of competition among different districts and states to come on top with respect to various performance parameters. So, the rankings of states in various social sectors based on quantitative objective criteria encourages these states and districts to improve their performance. Further, Niti Aayog also works closely with all stakeholders including state and union territory governments, concerned ministries and departments in developing an indicator frameworks, develop review mechanisms and also develop capacity building of these states so that they can improve on different parameters of these different indices released by Niti Aayog. So overall, the aspect of competitive federalism not only infuses the aspect of competition among states and districts but also helps in their overall development. Now, despite these important functions done by Niti Aayog, still there are certain criticism. And this will help you in answering any question based on critical analysis of Niti Aayog. So it says that it has no role in influencing private or public investment as Niti Aayog does not have any financial powers, which was earlier bestowed to the Planning Commission. So unlike Planning Commission, Niti Aayog does not have any financial powers. It further says that Niti Aayog does not seem to influence policy making with long term consequences, example demonetization and GST. Now another criticism of Niti Aayog is that as a think tank, it should maintain a respectable intellectual distance from the government. However, it has been seen praising the government's initiatives, schemes and programs. Further, Niti Aayog does not have the power to analyze the performance of various government schemes. Niti Aayog has not been able to meet its mandate in terms of fulfilling the needs of states. And the last criticism is that it has been granted too wide mandate and too many powers which can be counterproductive and prone to misuse. So overall we can say that Niti Aayog has played an important role not only in fostering cooperative federalism but also in encouraging states through rank based monitoring and also to improve their performance in diverse sectors. Thus this topic becomes important both from your prelims and mains perspective and questions can be asked both in your prelims and also mains under GS paper 2 with respect to polity and governance. The next news to be taken up appears on page number 13 which says Russia illegally holds disputed islands according to Japan. So Japan described four islands whose ownership is disputed with Moscow and according to Japan these are illegally occupied by Russia. And these islands are a part of Kuril Islands. And these Kuril Islands separates the Sea of Okhotsk and the North Pacific Ocean. So this group of Kuril Islands extends for 750 miles from southern tip of Kamchatka Peninsula in Russia, which is here, somewhere here, and to the northeastern corner of Hokkaido Islands of Japan. And this separate Sea of Okhotsk from the Pacific Ocean. And these 56 islands cover 6,000 square miles. And according to Japan, four of these islands are disputed with Moscow. So this news says that Japan is struggling to improve ties with Moscow to regain control of the Kurils, which Tokyo calls the Northern Territories. So the Northern Territories are a group of islands which Japan has sovereignty over and are an integral part of Japan's territory. But currently, they are illegally occupied by Russia, according to the reports by the Japanese government. So the description of the 2022 Diplomatic Blue Book, which is an annual report on Japan's foreign policy issued by the Foreign Ministry of Japan, has used the phrase for the first time in nearly two decades with respect to disputes with Russia. So from your examination perspective, you need to know that the Kuril Islands are disputed between Japan and Russia. And Kuril Island separate Sea of Okhotsk and Northern Pacific Ocean. There's a news article on page number 13. India extends duration of $400 million currency swap. This currency swap agreement India did with Sri Lanka. In the wake of economic crisis that the nation is facing, India has decided to extend the duration for the currency swap agreement. Previously, Mangalsar had a conceptual discussion as to what currency swap agreements are. Here is a representation of the same. So now let us understand how would the proposed dollar swap line work between India and United States of America. So let's say there is a swap that has been agreed to between these countries for dollar hundred applicable for three months. So in the first leg of such an agreement, the RBI would provide dollar hundred worth Indian rupees to the US Fed Bank. 
and this would be provided at prevailing exchange rate. And in return, the Fed Bank would provide equivalent value of dollars to the Reserve Bank of India. Now let's say the prevailing exchange rate is that one dollar is equal to rupees seventy. So effectively, the RBI would provide rupees seven thousand to the Fed Bank, and in turn, it would get dollar hundred. Now in the second leg, that is after three months, the U.S. Fed Bank would return rupees seventy thousand and take back dollar hundred from the Reserve Bank of India. And this transaction will take place at the exchange rate which was fixed in the first leg, that is. At dollar one equal to rupees seventy, and due to this fixation of the exchange rates, there is no exchange rate risk involved in the currency swap agreements. So now, if during the second leg of the transaction, that is after three months of the agreement, the exchange rate might have changed to dollar one equal to rupees eighty or dollar one equal to rupees sixty, but still the swap take place at the exchange rate which was agreed to in the first leg of the transaction. and that is why the swap agreement prevents both the central banks from any kind of exchange rate risks so basically under a swap line or swap agreement both the countries have fixed the exchange rate for a fixed period of time now how would such an agreement help india so the dollars which are availed under this currency swap agreement would act as second line of defense after the foreign exchange reserves and we note that RBI normally uses its foreign exchange reserve to arrest the currency volatility. Further, it will help in reducing the speculation in the forex market and would provide stability to the exchange rate. So now, what are the details of the currency swap agreement that India has signed with Sri Lanka? Now, as per the agreement, the Reserve Bank of India has decided to provide dollar four hundred million currency swap facility for Sri Lanka, and this agreement would not only be important for Sri Lankan economy. but it is also important from the indian interests point of view now we know that the higher dependence of the sri lankan government on the chinese loans has led to a form of debt trap for sri lanka and accordingly this agreement is in the form of a rescue package which has been extended by the indian government further this agreement paves the way for strengthening of economic relationship between india and sri lanka and thus such an agreement paves the way for opportunities in other avenues as well for example boosting of trade and investment between these two economies now after looking at the currency swap agreement which has been signed between india and sri lanka let us look at an analysis that has come up in today's newspaper which highlights the need for resetting ties between india and sri lanka 